I, I've been working on these topics of traditional ecological knowledge or indigenous knowledge since the 70s. Um, so I, I go back quite a bit, quite a few years. Uh, my, my main background, my resource area is, 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 uh, is marine, marine habitats and, and fisheries, coastal fisheries. But over the course of this work, um, I've had a chance to work with other systems, wildlife, protected areas, uh, forestry to some extent, not, not so much agriculture. Um, and over the past year, over the past day, I should say, we, we are with a group of young scholars from Hungary and neighboring countries. And I've, I've had a crash course in, in Hungarian ethnobotany over the past day. I would like to recognize members of our young scholars group. <clears throat> there are about 12, 12 of them in this room. And they are scattered, I guess, so I, I can't point out the individuals. But it's, it's great to be here working with them, but also to be with you here giving a lecture. There will be another lecture tomorrow at the Central European University. And in the second week, we will do field trips. So I will get a chance to see um, how traditional knowledge is practiced or local knowledge is practiced in Hungary. This was an opportunity for me to not just to come and give a quick lecture and disappear, but actually spend some time with young scholars but also some time in the field so I can learn as well from you. The international interest in traditional ecological knowledge, of course, goes back many years in ethnobiology, 1900s onwards. But in terms of its international interest, probably the first document that talks about indigenous knowledge was the the, the document that preceded the, the first Rio conference in 1992. This was the, the report of the World Commission on Environment and Development, published in 1987. And it said, tribal and indigenous people's lifestyles can offer modern societies many lessons in the management of complex ecosystems. It went on to, uh, to identify specifically uh, what it called marginal ecosystems, uh, such as dry lands, mountain environments. Uh, of course, for the people who live there, they're not considered marginal environments. It's, it's their main environment in which they're most comfortable. Um, the lessons of traditional knowledge, though, since then has been that in all ecosystems you find local knowledge or traditional knowledge. And, and people find ways of, of, uh, of adapting to their ecosystems and, and making good use of them. So this, uh, the, the topic of traditional ecological knowledge to me is, is, is not an esoteric topic. It's, it's not an anthropological curiosity. But this is very much living knowledge of people adapting and working with the environments in which they live. Uh, most of my travels, as, as you'll see in the slides coming up, have taken me to, um, to what, what you might consider unusual places in, in, in Asia, South America, and so on. I've, I've actually not been very much to Europe, um, except that I, I've been working with uh, my Swedish colleagues at, at Stockholm University and the Swedish Royal Academy. And this building reminds me somewhat of the Swedish Royal Academy, where they give the Nobel Prize, of course. Um, but as, as I discovered over the course of yesterday, very largely, that, that this, this topic is very much alive in, in Hungary and probably other countries like Romania. And uh, per, perhaps I should, I should forego visits to Thailand and such places and spend more time here. OK. so. Uh, traditional knowledge has, has, does have a history and, and diverse origins. And, uh, and I know many in the audience are ethnobotanists, ethnobiologists, and that, that is the, the origin. But the current practice of traditional knowledge, indigenous knowledge, is something more than ethnobiology, because it incorporates many other disciplines as well. Um, 
in the history of this, this discipline, though, there are a few documents that, that come up. And, and one of them uh, was some, some taxonomic work by a scholar, I think American, uh, by the name of Conklin. And he published an, an, a report for the, the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization, 1957, where he documented an amazing number of species recognized by tribal groups in the Philippines. This was a bit of revelation because uh, people really had been doing a lot of ethnobiology, but, but had no idea that, that there could be some very extensive naming systems of, of, of wild plants, as well as, of course, the more of what you would expect of, of domesticated plants and their varieties, varieties of rice, for example, in the case of Philippines. Also important in this history is the work of the French anthropologist Claude Lévi-Strauss um, and, and his book, Le Pensée Sauvage, The Savage Mind, uh, somewhat mistranslated, I guess, into English because we don't talk about savages anymore. But what he documented was the idea that, that the non-scientist mind of, of indigenous people, in fact, is capable of making inquiries and not just uh, a study of plants and animals which are used, but also plants and animals and other items in the environment, other components of the environment, which are of not necessarily of any practical use. Um, so a number of disciplines then come into play. Uh, linguistics is often important. Uh, ethnoecology uh, makes ethnobiology more dynamic by looking at ecological relationships, and then human ecology of various kinds. Uh, in the area of, closer to my original area, marine ecology, some of the best traditional knowledge comes from tropical marine biologists who, who in fact have no training in ethnobiology at all, but who look at it from the point of view of marine coastal ecosystems, people like Robert Johannes. Now, traditional ecological knowledge is also incorporated into the current international environmental agenda in a number of ways. And some of it goes back quite a bit. Um, some of the earliest ones involve the United Nations program, the UNESCO program on traditional management systems, which were in fact mostly about marine ecosystems, and that's 1983 onwards. So some of the more recent, if you like, traditional ecological knowledge does go back to the 80s. In the area of conservation, uh, International Union for the Conservation of Nature, IUCN, based in, of course, Switzerland, not far from here, uh, has used ideas and has put emphasis on traditional ecological knowledge from 1984 onwards. Um, and after that, there are a number of documents. I, I don't try to cover everything. It, it would be pointless. But some of the important ones that have come up and the ones that I have first-hand information on, first-hand knowledge of, are, are initiative, initiatives such as the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment of 2005, which was carried out by the Arctic Council, which has an eight-nation membership of Arctic countries, including Greenland, Norway, Canada, US, and so on. Um, and this document in its uh, 12 chapters includes two chapters that concentrate on the knowledge and adaptations of local people and the observations they make on climate change. So it was a groundbreaking document in the, the level of detail uh, that was brought together from, for example, Norway, the Sami areas, the Canadian Inuit areas, and so on that not only showed that there's a great deal of local knowledge, but this local knowledge can be put together to generate a picture of the larger regional impact of climate change. In other words, what the Sami were observing was actually quite consistent with what the Alaska indigenous people were observing. 
The Millennium Ecosystem Assessment is another milestone document. Uh, this was a big project that was carried out in a huge amount of hurry, and I don't know how, how they actually finished it. It involved more than a thousand scientists in more than a hundred countries, and it was carried out over a five-year period by a very, very efficient American, Walter Reed, uh, who also put together the number of volumes, and one of these volumes uh, deals with uh, with indigenous knowledge. This is the one that's called Bridging Scales and Knowledge Systems. And in, in fact, it's, the, the whole document is available on the web, and it's, uh, it, it shows an, um, it's, it's a selection of papers out of one of the meetings of the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment that met in Alexandria, Egypt, in the, in the library of Alexandria, which, uh, which excited me very much until I discovered that, in fact, the original library had burned down in the year 1000. And, uh, and the building we were in sort of looked, again, a bit like this, but was, was nothing like the original library of Alexandria. Currently, there is, uh, there's a lot of interest, uh, and probably many of you have come across this, the IPBS. IPBS is the, uh, is the biodiversity equivalent of, the, of, of, uh, of IPCC, the Climate Change Panel. And uh, it became active, it, it's very new, it started only in 2012. Um, and from the outset, it's, it, it established a working group on, on indigenous knowledge, what they call ilk, uh, indigenous and local knowledge. And, uh, uh, so Dr. Molnar is actually the Hungarian uh, representative on that panel, uh, and it has many people from, from representing all the various regions. Uh, there, there are more members here, yes. Um, and uh, that is the current interest, and this is the attempt to put indigenous knowledge to work uh, for biodiversity conservation. And it's considered a very important part of the overall IPBS program. Okay, so I've been using terms. You may, you may say, well, what exactly do you mean by these terms you use? Um, this is my working definition for traditional ecological knowledge. Uh, it has a number of, of, of features to it. And uh, even in yesterday's discussion, I, I'm, I'm, I'm contemplating adding some additional items to this definition. But what, what I try to do in this definition is that, first, it's a cumulative body of knowledge. Second, it, it has components of knowledge, practice, and belief. Knowledge is like, in this case, the identification of species. The practice is what, what people do. It's basically the, the interaction between humans and the environment. Uh, this is what makes the knowledge applied and useful, or not in some cases. But it also has a belief component, and this is the part that, that many scientists have trouble with. But if you talk to any indigenous knowledge holders, traditional knowledge holders, they will tell you that indigenous knowledge isn't just knowledge of things, it's a moral concept. It's a, Indigenous knowledge has an explicit, recognized uh, component of, of belief. Now, you might say, well, science, of course, has, has a belief component too, but it's, you know, most scientists don't talk about it. Uh, the belief component in science is, is implicit, uh, whereas in traditional knowledge, it is explicit. The knowledge holders will tell you that it is about values and ethics, and not just about knowledge of things. Uh, indigenous knowledge I define more broadly, and I should warn you that many other experts do not, in fact. They, they, they define it different ways, but I define it more broadly than traditional ecological knowledge, and I define it, uh, this is consistent with, uh, with Professor Warren, uh, who uh, is a US scientist who, who did the agricultural component of this, and it's knowledge held by an indigenous peoples or local knowledge unique to a given culture or society. So when I use indigenous knowledge, I don't necessarily to, uh, refer to indigenous people. It could be, it could be anyone. 
um, indigenous or non-indigenous. I use local knowledge to mean knowledge that has a shorter time depth um, than traditional ecological knowledge. So if a herder is a herder for five generations, to me that's traditional ecological knowledge. Um, if a herder is just learning the craft but still has a lot of knowledge, to me that's, that's local knowledge. Uh, so to me one of the criteria for traditional ecological knowledge is that, that it's handed down through generations and it's by cultural transmission, not book learning. But it also evolves by adaptive processes, by, by which I mean adaptive in the evolutionary biology sense, uh, adaptive through feedback learning, uh, and not necessarily genetic, um, although there may be genetic components. So there, thus it differs from, from scientific knowledge. There are scholars who say there is no real distinction Aaron Agarwal, who's an American scholar of Indian background, makes the argument that there is no objective criteria to delineate traditional knowledge from scientific knowledge. He, he, he says they're all mixed, their knowledge is always mixed, uh, and, and there's, no, there's no point in this continuum. There's no specific point where you can say, ha, that's scientific knowledge, and this is traditional knowledge. I have some sympathy to that position, but when I talk to indigenous people, they, they think it's quite distinct from scientific knowledge, if only for the reason that they get it culturally, orally, from their parents and grandparents, and not from books. So wh what is traditional knowledge, uh, and, and, and who are these knowledge holders? Uh, the series of photos are from three regions that I've been active in. This is the north, Canadian and US north. Um, indigenous knowledge holders are people you often meet in smoky rooms, like the one in the photo. Crowded, smoky, there's this wood stove going somewhere and you're talking with Inuit knowledge holders. So that's where you get the knowledge. But to see what it is and what it does, you step out uh, into the open and uh, the photo shows um, smoked whitefish and char drying slowly on the racks. Um, some, of, some of the smoked fish you might say is a piece of art, edible art, but, but art, there are actually three different species on that rack uh, and they're all very tasty. So, one of the advantages in, in being a researcher of traditional ecological knowledge is that one eats good fish. Also one eats, I guess, if you're working with herders, some good cheese and other products. Uh, here's another setting. Where do you find the knowledge holders? Uh, this, is, this is Kyrgyzstan, Central Asia. And uh, I'm with a group of people and many of these are, are are reciters of the, the Kyrgyz epic manas. These are manas chis. There's one singer who's not a manas chi, and then there's one student who also happens to be in this room wearing still his hat. Uh, where's the hat? <laughs> Down there, <laughs> yes. Um, and uh, so you, you, now in the case of Kyrgyzstan, you talk to Manaschis because they are the keepers of this long-term knowledge, which is one big epic poem uh, about the Kyrgyz hero who has battles and uh, has many adventures. Uh, it's hard to date the epic, but one of the theories is that the hero, although he's not called Attila, may in fact be Attila. But that's only a theory. It was translated into Hungarian last year, the whole uh, epic. The whole epic has been trans, but the whole epic is very, very long. The whole thing was translated, that's amazing, okay. So it's, it's one of the longest epics. Um, I think the Tibetan rivals it, but. Uh, now, again, so those are the knowledge holders. 
You can meet them there. In this case, not a very small key room, but you, you can also step out of the room and talk to holders who are practicing that knowledge, in this case, training of, of eagles and falcons. A trained Kyrgyz eagle can actually kill a wolf, so they can protect herds. Another setting, Taiwan, um, where do you meet the knowledge holders? Well, typically, again, around tables, like the one in the photo. Um, but then you step out into the environment, and uh, the, this is Taiwan in a river valley, and, this, and the, the slope of the valley is so steep that every now and then, in fact, more than every now and then, they, they have constant uh, earthquakes, and the sides of those hills come down. So they live in a very unusual environment where uh, you're constantly dealing with your planting area, which may just slide out into the river. In fact, the whole river may change course after a few slides, landslides. Now, the main part of the talk is going to uh, be about the importance of traditional ecological knowledge uh, in a variety of areas. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, so I, I'm going to refer to these six areas. You can divide them differently. In fact, the book has a slightly different division of, of these areas. Uh, but the, the reason I do this is that it gives you an idea on a, on a range of areas, range of topics in, in which traditional knowledge is recognized and used. In some cases, used a great deal. In some cases, not used very much. So I, I pick each of these, I pick up each of these topics in turn and talk about them. And, uh, and we can, of course, expand on it in discussion period if you like. So first, let's uh, talk about uh, traditional ecological knowledge for biological information, ecological insights. Uh, I've already mentioned some of the uses. Uh, it's, it's useful for taxonomy. And, uh, and indigenous people often recognize many species and varieties. Herders in Hungary recognize species of plants in the hundreds. So this is, for urban people, this is uh, difficult to comprehend that somebody can, can actually recognize hundreds of species, some of which are, are useful for herding. In other words, the animals eat it, but some are not, in fact, uh, species eaten by, by animals. And the, the knowledge of Hungarian herders is, is not unique in the world. There, there are other places where people recognize plants. Uh, a study by a colleague ethnobotanist uh, in Western Turkey identifies or, or talks about around 300 edible wild plants that people know, collect, and eat present day. 300. Um, my, my wife and I have a small place on the Mediterranean. We, we know in the market you don't get anything like that. Uh, so I was actually skeptical. This is the work of Artu. Uh, I was skeptical. So we were in the, in the, in the, in the western part, in the Aegean, uh, visiting a small university. And uh, they, they put us up in a, um, in a small boutique hotel which spe specialized in in, in cooking of, of local wild vegetables. And, and we were astounded because, you know, there were things that, that we never thought anybody, or we, we never thought of as, as edible food being served in, in amazing ways, but also the, 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 the variety of things and, and where they came from. Uh, some were plants at the sea edge, some were Plants in the uh, in the in the hills, no high mountains there. So we're not talking about alpine plants, but of course they were coming from various vegetation zones, and there was a huge variety, and people seemed to know them. Um, here I mention 
agriculture, for example, the Three Sisters agriculture, which is a mix of corn, beans, and squash, um, traditionally practiced by indigenous groups in southern Canada and, and much of the US. And I've been told that, in fact, in Hungary, uh, there are areas where they experiment with this particular mix. Um, people who are better agriculturalists and ethnobotanists than I am, of course, immediately recognize that corn and beans makes good companion planting because of nitrogen fixing. So, so, so many of these have ecological explanations, but of course the people will not tell you about nitrogen fixing as a, as a key part of this, this companion planting, but, but this is something that develops by trial and error over many years. Traditional knowledge contributes missing knowledge in many cases. I'm going to give you an example in a moment. Um, uh, in, in the case of uh, endangered species, protected species, um, there often is local knowledge available that's, that complements scientific knowledge. Uh, my Swedish colleague, Johan Kolding, once did study, looked at the IUCN Red Book, which you know is the book of, of endangered and vulnerable species. And, and he actually found that about one third of the species listed in the Red Book are considered taboo species by various indigenous groups around the world. So there's a, there's a potentially very strong uh, conservation component to, to some of this knowledge because people already recognize some of these species like jaguars in South America and so on as, as, um, as something special to the extent that they are tabooed, tabooed from hunting and killing. Traditional knowledge also comes into play in this category. Uh, when you look at scales of knowledge, it provides the local knowledge to a bigger scientific knowledge about, about a larger area. So this is the example of, of one little known species. It's, a, it's the only shark species endemic to the Eastern Arctic. It's called the Greenland shark. Uh, and there is very little biological information on this shark. So our graduate student, Julian Idrobo went to the, the Inuit village of Pangertun and, and worked with, with the Inuit hunters. Now, Inuit are famous for having very detailed knowledge of their environment. But in fact, this is a species so rarely seen that there was very little information on this. But he did find people who could reconstruct the marine food web. Um, so these are two different hunters, if you like local experts or experts in traditional knowledge, and they produced their own marine food web and placed the shark in that food web. I don't have a pointer, so I can't show you, but, but if you can read it, you can, you can probably see it. But the, the details aren't really so important because there are obviously differences between them. The, 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 the question that should pop into your minds is, do Inuit hunters really make maps of marine food webs? And the answer is, in fact, they do not. Um, what Julian was doing here was he was co-producing knowledge. He was, he was coaxing knowledge out of Inuit hunters, and together they were putting it in a form that would be understandable to marine ecologists. And that form is the form of a marine food web. Um, but what it showed is, is what this shark was likely to eat. The, the shark is the lower box in each case. What they're likely to eat, and you notice these are broken lines because the, the Inuit are pretty careful about their knowledge. If they're not sure, they will not claim that that, that is the truth. Um, so they were saying, well, very likely this is what happens. So, so part of this marine food web is the broken lines, 
and some of it is solid lines where they really do know who eats who. Um, but what Julian produced out of this is what we call uh, co-production of knowledge. You, you, you get some, some scientists and you get some <clears throat> locally knowledgeable experts and together they produce something that neither of them alone would otherwise have. And uh, I, I think some of the Herder work you're doing has elements of that co-production of knowledge. Um, in this case, this was interesting because there, there really was a group of, of biologists. Julian himself actually is a terrestrial ecologist, so he's not a specialist in this area, but he did ac have access to, to, to biological experts, and he had access and he was able to convince the Inu to talk about this little known species. Little known because this area, this is Baffin Bay, 1,000 meters deep, and it, this, this shark typically lives at the bottom, but comes up occasionally. And it comes up as a bycatch sometimes in a halibut fishery. Okay? So that's an example of putting together this kind of biological, ecological knowledge. The scale question, and this is the book I referred to earlier, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. Um, the scale question is an interesting one because it immediately establishes the notion that uh, if you're managing a park, it's good to know somebody who knows the details of the, of let's say the wetlands in that park or the details of some of the birds who come to that park or the details of, of how the wetland area has changed over the years. Uh, in Northern Canada, we're finding that a lot of wetlands are actually drying out with presumably as a result of climate change. So this also creates a way of co-producing knowledge where the local knowledge complements the, the broader picture produced by science through remote sensing and so on. In the Western Canadian Arctic, um, here's an, another example of beluga conservation in the Western Canadian Arctic. Uh, the people looking at the map include a, 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 a biologist in the, in the reddish sweater who, who knows a lot about the, the, the beluga. Uh, and he's working on the map with two Inuit experts who know what the beluga do in the area. And it results in joint management. Now, what's wrong with this picture? Nobody? Well, what's wrong with this picture is that despite all these, these joint working efforts, the biologists are still using biological techniques of, of, of capturing, marking, uh, taking blood samples, which the Inuit consider improper. It's, it's impolite, it's uh, immoral to, to handle animals. So in fact, <clears throat> since that photo, they have changed the techniques. Uh, so, so many of these beluga are, are not captured and tagged, but in fact, they're tracked through other techniques, much more acceptable to indigenous knowledge. So traditional knowledge for resource management, uh, well, some of that, the, the biology discussion already covers that. Um, the important point is, is the, the, the moral idea of, of uh, the knowledge being used for keeping the land. That's a phrase used by, for example, Ojibwa people, the Anishinaabe. Uh, Australian indigenous people talk about caring for country, but they mean exactly the same thing. Um, there's a quotation from the Kyrgyz about the, the responsibility of taking good care of the land. And some of these, the, these, these interconnections are actually encoded in language from the Sami of Norway. Eilat, pasture. Eilu, herd. Eilin, life. 
obviously these are connected things. So the pasture and the herd is life or something very close to it. The Hawaiian Integrated Watershed Management System had almost disappeared at the turn of, 19, at the turn of 1900s. This is the Ahu Poa system, whereby you have a, a protected upper watershed uh, that comes down the slopes into uh, an agricultural zone and then a lower zone, and all the way to the lagoon margin where the ancient Hawaiians actually practiced aquaculture. And the, the boundaries of this ecosystem are lava flows. As you know, most Hawaiian islands are volcanic islands, and they are cones that are split by these, these lava flows. So this is a, a very neat ecosystem management concept and it's being revived in, in Hawaii. Padu system in South India. Some of the details I'm going to skip, uh, although um, my colleague said, uh, don't rush it. Uh, I, I shouldn't be too late with it either. So uh, moving on. Um, Many of the indigenous systems are still alive. I, I didn't realize, for example, that there were still uh, indigenous salmon stream management systems in North America. And a colleague, Frank Lake, who is a Karuk Indian from Northern California, said, yeah, the system is still alive in the river that my family fishes in. And so how the system works is that um, each, each settlement, each settlement, uh, has its own fishery as the salmon move up the river. And, uh, and they send runners, they send messengers, probably today, today, these days by cell phone. They, they send messages about the strength of the run so that, so that the fishing can be organized around the cycle, which first allows a certain escapement, which is the, the broodstock to go up the river to spawn. And in this particular area, which is Frank's own area, um, the shadow of this particular mountain tells, signals which family has the fishing right. So you use the natural system. It's not you know, by a written calendar, but, but by the shadow that everybody can see where the fish should be and where the fishing should be. Traditional knowledge for biodiversity conservation, it comes up in many national park areas. I'm going to mention one national park uh, in Turkey. Uh, my wife and I still go to Turkey periodically. I'm, I'm a Canadian of Turkish background with a name that sounds Hungarian, but that's possible. We're related somewhat. Um, this is a national park that's interesting. It has, a, it has rather unusual number of endemic plant species, 32 of them. And it's, it's home to a, uh, a, a, a and, and uh, sort of a, uh, an ethnic group that has more recent roots from Central Asia. They settled in the area in the 1400s and they became woodworkers, but they also kept very good care of their forest. <clears throat> uh, some of this culture includes what you might call pre-Islamic elements. Um, for example, the tops of mountains and hills are considered sacred. Um, so you can see a small hilltop here with its native vegetation, and below it is just olive groves. But the olive groves don't go all the way to the top. Uh, the most sacred hilltop mountain, it's not very high, is called Sarıkız Tepe. And, uh, and there are annual pilgrimages to the site where you, where you hang uh, prayer flags, wish flags. Um, I used to associate this with, with the Buddhist tradition from, from work I did in the 90s in northern India. But in fact, I think it's a Central Asian tradition, it's a shaman tradition. Uh, and, and here is the Kyrgyz counterpart of flags. The Kyrgyz don't put up just a few flags. They, they put up flags. They put up hundreds of flags. So this is from a national park, Ala Archa National Park, near Bishkek.
Traditional knowledge is used for environmental monitoring. And here I give you some examples and photos from the Sami herders of northern Norway. Uh, I'm also using this to illustrate some of the differences and complementarities between indigenous knowledge and scientific knowledge. And the argument I make goes like this. And this is published with a paper with my wife uh, in the journal Futures. Traditional knowledge, we argue, uses rules of thumb, um, some, some shorthand. Rules of thumb meaning very few rules that, that you can count on, the, on, on a hand. Uh, and traditional knowledge uses a qualitative assessment of a large number of variables, some of which are going to be key variables. This is different from science for monitoring, which uses quantitative assessment of a small number of variables, simply because you cannot quantify and handle in a model a very large number of variables. People have done it, it doesn't work. So for example, much of climate change research is based on a very limited set of variables. But when indigenous people observe climate change, they are looking at a larger number. Uh, in the Western Canadian Arctic, about 25, but some of these are, are more important variables than others. But let's see what happens in the Sami case. So the, the argument is that they're using fuzzy logic to make sense of the environment when they're monitoring the environment. And fuzzy logic isn't, doesn't mean bad logic. It, it's a, it's a, it's, it comes out of engineering, and it's a form of probabilistic logic that deals with complex systems but the reasoning is approximate rather than exact. And I think it's a good fit for traditional knowledge. So here's what happens. Here's a, here's a Sami reindeer herd. This is, we're near Katokeino, north of the Swedish border, inland in northern Norway. The herd moves with the snow conditions. They don't move when they run out of food because they trample the snow until the, the food is no longer available. The snow is compacted, and the herd starts moving when they cannot reach the food. When the herd moves, the herders move. They're on snow machines. And you need a combination of three snow machines, four dogs, or and you use dogs in, in Hungarian herding as well. Um, or fewer people, more dogs, or more dogs, fewer people. But the point is, you, you, you start moving the herd, but in fact, you don't actively move the herd. The herd has its own logic. The herd has its own um, uh, willpower, if you like. The, the herd moves, and the herder facilitates the move. The herder doesn't actually move the herd. Now, what do they do? Uh, this is the chief herder, Aslak, uh, with the shovel. Aslak digs a, a, a hole in the snow where the herd is moving toward. What Aslak is checking is whether the snow is appropriate for the herd. He is checking if the animals are going to be able to dig down to the lichen layer. And he establishes that by checking to see if there are crusts in the, in the snow profile. If the crusts are too thick, the animals cannot dig down. So he's checking for crusts, or he's checking for crusts which are manageable by the larger animals, which make the holes for the smaller animals. And uh, that's what the, the snow profile looks like. And the Sami have an astounding vocabulary of snow terms to describe what they're seeing, because Aslak is going to transmit this knowledge to the next herder as well. So if there is a one major crust, often something as a result of a rainfall event during snow. We have about 60 centimeters of snow. Uh, and Aslak has found, I think, three crusts in that profile, but they're manageable. So, so Aslak helps the herd move to this area because he knows they can dig down. Um, 
And I, I was a bit puzzled. I, I said, Aslak, how do you judge snow? He said, simple. Waist high, hip high, ankle high, or knee high, rather. Uh, and I said, why are, you, why are you measuring how many centimeters? And not only that, he's got a thermometer at the bottom of the, the hole, you know? Uh, he said, oh, I'm just collecting data for the Norwegian Meteorological <laughs> Organization. So, so he still had his own system, and he was describing the snow depth by this fuzzy logic criteria of three spots. But he didn't mind. He can also collect some data for the government. Climate change is a big topic, and I'm going to give you some examples from the Andes. This is the work of uh, my postdoc, Swiss postdoc, Sebastian Boya. Sebastian couldn't survive in, in, in Manitoba. It's too flat. So he ended up in the Andes, uh, and, and he found mountains suitable for a Swiss. Uh, but much more exciting, apparently, than Switzerland. I, I, I can't say. I, I don't want to offend any Swiss who may be in this room. <laughs> so now, this area is very interesting in that uh, there's a lot of, uh, lot of ethnic diversity, a lot of vegetation diversity. So this is a high biocultural diversity area. And it's a, it's a, it's a complex area in terms of in mountains and, and effects of, of climate change. Um, I don't want to get into the details. I may already have too many details here. But uh, uh, this is the Cochabamba area of, of the Bolivian Andes, where all the models show and all the locals will tell you that overall the climate is getting warmer. But that's a very, very gross story. That's, that's not, in fact, a very helpful story, just to say it's getting warmer overall. Because what they're really seeing is something in much more detail. Of course, the, the comparison I'm making here is these, these global and regional climate change models that tell you the overall temperature change averaged and the overall precipitation change averaged out. But local people don't respond to averages. They respond to extreme events and unexpected events and variabilities. So what the local knowledge is contributing here uh, are that kind of detail that fills in the climate change models, which to, for most intents and purposes, for most fishers and wildlife people I know, they're, they're really not very useful. Because the kind of, of changes you're seeing are things like, uh, like crop pests increasing. Shrub encroachment, changing the, uh, the, the mountain, uh, the hillside, vegetation of the hillside. But more specifically, in the highlands, the, the, the main concern was violent rains, which, which carried the, the topsoil, which is very thin to begin with. But in the valleys, the, the main concern was different. It was drought, but also unpredictable rain events much more violent, much more intensive than they had previously. However, most climate change stories are bad news stories. In this case, let's balance it with some good news. Some farmers are actually taking advantage of the, this overall warming to grow potatoes on corn in altitudes they never planted before. But the explanation, the, the, the local narrative about this was not in terms of climate change, but rather in terms of change as part of a cycle, including a belief in the return to, to mythological times of the Inca Empire. So Sebastian uh, mapped some of these areas, and the paper is published in Ecology and Society. And what people were doing was that they are increasing the upper limit of the potato to 4,100 meters, 4,100 meters potato, and corn up to 3,600 meters. Um, Cochabamba, the city is in the south. These are Google Maps. 
Um, and people were opening up these plots. And they were really testing. They, uh, they weren't sure they're going to produce anything, but they were testing because they never planted in these altitudes before. And some cases, they were successful. In other cases, they were not. But of course, they're experts in, in scattering their plots. Um, also, these two white areas, what, what are they? Are there glaciers in the Andes? There are, but they're rapidly disappearing. These two remnants of glaciers are supposed to disappear at the current rate. They will disappear in 20 years. So climate change is real in these parts. Now, uh, how do these guys adapt to a variable environment? Uh, what Sebastian mapped is the family uh, plots of five families. What you see is that the plots are scattered. They're scattered at different latitudes and different aspects of a mountain. So living in a highly variable environment, these people uh, do not take the chance of planting everything in one plot, as you might in Hungary, but, but they are in small discontinuous plots. So when one fails, the other one works, the other one succeeds. So they're using the same logic to, to deal with climate change by experimenting with plots where they'd never planted before. This is a very interesting map. It doesn't come out from our work. It comes from uh, publications by the American anthropologist Ben Orlov. There's one in Scientific American and one in Nature. And uh, when it first came up, I, I was skeptical. I didn't even find out about it because you know most of my traditional knowledge is not about um, stars and weather prediction, which this one is. Uh, when I found out, I asked Sebastian whether he could check with Bolivians whether this thing is real. I, I'm a skeptical scientist, so I'm always checking to see if something is real. Uh, and Sebastian said, well, I don't have to check. I know it's real. In, in fact, Bolivian master's students produce theses on this topic. But of course, they're not translated into English or Hungarian, so we, we never find out about them. Uh, now, what, how the system works is that the elders uh, climb up to higher hills um, in, in, in winter, in the beginning of winter. And they observe this particular star cluster, Pleiades. And if they see bright stars, they predict good rains for the next crop season and plant accordingly. They are sufficiently comfortable in their prediction that they actually plant according to these predictions. And if they see a dim cluster, then they predict bad rains and they plant according to that. Now, what Ben Orlov and his team did, and his team included climatologists, is that um, Basically, what they're checking is El Nino years. Some years are El Nino, where the current behaves one way in the Pacific, and some years are not El Nino, when the current behaves in a different way. And it, it affects the season for the whole southern hemisphere for the following year. And, uh, and it has to do with the refra refractivity of the atmosphere. Uh, if there is a warm air mass, that, that rises, then you see the star cluster in a different way because Pleiades is right at the, uh, at the horizon. The Inuit of Northern Canada have been seeing something like this and it has been puzzling them. There's a movie on that. Uh, so, so again, here's indigenous knowledge. In this case, used for prediction. In the Inuit case, a source of puzzlement because the, the, where the sunset seems to be different, but it has to do with, with uh, cold and hot air masses in the atmosphere. What Orlov's team found, this is a quotation from the paper itself, because rainfall in this region is generally sparse in El Nino years, the simple method of observing the Pleiades near the horizon at a certain time of the year provides a forecast as good or better than predictions based on computer modeling. Okay, so let's finish up with, with a little bit on, 
on traditional knowledge on environmental ethics. I, I, I commented on the importance of, of, of the ethical dimension, the moral dimension of, of uh, indigenous knowledge, traditional ecological knowledge. Um, and then I gave you some quotes about traditional beliefs about um, responsibility for the earth um, and the, the obligation to, to protect the land. Um, the, the ethical position of many indigenous people, probably plus some non-indigenous people who are in close contact with the nature is that is that humans and nature are in a close relationship, not just close, but a, a symbiotic relationship. You can't, you know, cities are artificial, really. Uh, for people who live close to the earth, uh, you're, you're clearly dependent on what happens in the soil, what happens with the plants, what happens with the animals. You see the flight of storks that, that tell you certain things. Uh, and if you're really good, you can also read the stars to predict next year's rainfall. Uh, but as far as I know, only the Andean people do that, although there is some evidence from the Maori of New Zealand as well in predicting harvests of seabirds. Uh, so much of this adds up to mutual obligations of respect, uh, mutual obligations, obligations of people to nature, and it's shown as respect. And that term comes up time and again as a central idea in relation of many indigenous groups with nature, with their environment. And uh, so the, these are the quotes I had earlier about caring for country and, and keeping the land. And how it shows up in some cases is through uh, sacred sites, sacred areas. This is the work of uh, Ibek Samakov, who's with us in the group of young scholars. This is the Isukul Lake, uh, a very large, high, high uh, altitude lake at 1,600 meters. Uh, it's in the Kyrgyz Republic. It's a beautiful lake. Um, and, and what you see on the horizon that, that may look like clouds is, in fact, the snowy caps of of 7,000 meter peaks. This is the Ala Tu, uh, or, or in most uh, possibly European maps, it's used, the Chinese name is used, uh, escapes my mind, <laughs> uh, Tian, Shan, Tian Shan Mountains, or what the Uyghur call um, Tengri, Tengri Mountains, meaning God's Mountains. Uh, so Ibeck went to this lake, uh, this is the map, and Ibeck mapped out the sacred sites in that whole area. And, and he says this is probably not exhaustive, but you can see there are quite a few. And they're also varied. So these individual sacred sites include rivers, they include springs in, in dry areas, and of course it includes the whole lake itself. When I asked the herders around Isikul Lake whether they were observing climate change, they said, well, we're observing some anomalies, but in fact, we live in Isikul Lake, and Isikul Lake just absorbs these negative things. Like, it's your good luck charm, that if you have that good luck charm, it's going to deflect these negative influences. Now, sacred sites are very well known. This one actually is my photo from uh, the Commons Conference of two years ago in Japan. Anybody recognize this Japanese landmark? Fujiyama, uh, which is probably one of the best known international landmarks as a sacred site. And uh, now some of these, these sacred areas are not just sacred, they're culturally important, they're also part of the cultural aesthetics of a, of, a, of a group. And these two photos are from the, the gardens of the Golden Temple and the Silver Temple in Kyoto, Japan, the, uh, the Japanese city, which is also a World Heritage Site. And uh, as you can see, the, the aesthetics. 
So, uh, some quick conclusions. Traditional knowledge um, is no longer an esoteric field practiced by a very you know, few um, strange scholars. Uh, it's an interdisciplinary area. It includes a lot of ethnobiology, but it also includes other sciences, including climate science, including ecology, marine ecology, including obviously geography, human geography. Um, and there are not just an increasing recognition of, of traditional ecological knowledge as, a, as an interdisciplinary area, but also uh, increased interest in ways to combine it with science. Uh, because it's, it's part of the knowledge of humanity. It's part of, if you like, the leaves of a dictionary. And uh, if we're going to solve <clears throat> environmental problems, to, to solve our environmental problems, local and global, we need to be able to use all knowledge we can. And, uh, and the argument here is that there's no such thing as good knowledge, bad knowledge. Um, traditional knowledge doesn't fit science in, in many ways, but it has its own logic and it can be tested against the knowledge of other knowledge holders, for example, in the case of the Sami. It's, it's very easy to test the knowledge of Aslak who makes a snow profile, because in the next valley there is another herder who uses exactly the same technique, and they can keep their herds alive uh, grazing on top of 60 centimeters of snow. It's survival knowledge, but it's also detailed knowledge that supplements the Norwegian meteorological system. How we combine it with science is, is up to our creativity and up to our um, ability to deal with different notions and to be open to different kinds of knowledge. One way to argue it is to say that, that this is knowledge at different scales and we can take advantage of that local scale expertise, whether we're doing parks planning or whether we're doing uh, floodplain agriculture where apparently in Hungary indigenous knowledge, local knowledge also comes into play. Um, we, we can certainly learn a lot about the local differences in climate change effects in the Andes because the, the gross climate models gives us pretty useless information as, as far as the local resource users are concerned. They give us good global scale knowledge and an idea where things are headed but they really don't tell us nearly as much as what the local knowledge holders can tell us. There are two other very important aspects to this. It's not just uh, a utilitarian add to your knowledge idea. Um, working with local people, fostering their stewardship ethics and building our own is a very important part of this overall um, attempt to use traditional and indigenous knowledge. Because we can learn from the stewardship traditions of Australian indigenous people, and well, they can learn something from us, but we have to be careful not to tell them too much because it's, it's somewhat off-putting. Scientists telling locals what to do. The other aspect of it is that um, <clears throat> participatory research, uh, which often is the way you, you, you need to do local and traditional knowledge, um, it brings science down to earth. It brings scientists back down to earth and to humanity. It's really important, I think, for scientists, un unless you're, you're working on, you know, you're a physicist working on quarks or something. Uh, you know, much of science has to be grounded. Many scientists, I think, can benefit from being grounded, being, being exposed to the day-to-day -day realities of 
how people make a living, what kinds of knowledge they hold. Um, so I see uh, traditional knowledge research as somewhat revolutionary in the sense of, of, uh, of adding some humanity to science and making scientists more responsive, more reflective, and, uh, and I think in the long run, better scientists. <clears throat> and participatory research where the knowledge holders are part of the research team is one way to do that. Thank you. Thank you.